Hey ladies, how are we doing? This week is chapter 10, self-protection. Um, I'm sitting in my bed. We're in my bedroom today. I felt like this was the safest place that I know to be. Do any of you agree with that? Today is an unusually rainy day from what I understand to be a series of rainy, rainy, rainy days. And it also happens to be my 45th birthday. Happy birthday to me. I feel like I could have been disappointed right from the start with the uh, rain, but I felt like when I sat down to do my morning pages that the creator was reminding me that this is a time of cleansing for me and a year of cleansing. I feel like I got a new word for this year. And how fitting is it that if that's the word that I got, that we're going to experience several days of rain. So I'm going to look at this as an opportunity for healing growth and not, oh, it's a bummer because it's monsooning all day today. <laughs> On with the chapter. It's good to be with all of you, even if it's virtually. All right, so self-protection, it says as a summary that this week we explore the perils that can ambush us on our creative path. I would like to take that a step further and say just our path in life. Because creativity is a spiritual issue, many of the perils are spiritual perils. In the essays, tasks, and exercise of the week, we'll search out the toxic patterns we cling to that block our flow, creative flow, but just flow, I think, in life. So she goes in, there's a lot to cover. <laughs> and I want to leave some of the reading. I'm hoping that some of you um, will highlight some of the reading this week. Sometimes I read a lot. I'm going to go through more of just the interpretation from the reading. Um, but maybe you'll have some passages that you'd like to share because there were some really good ones. And when they're read out loud, they evoke emotion and feelings personally for each one of you that we don't get if I just preach at you, which is what I can do. I know. Thanks for loving me anyway. <laughs> All right. So creative blocks. Um, creative blocks basically are sabotage. They are sabotaging your freedom your ability to dream and your creativity. So let's think a little bit more about what ambushes our creativity. Okay, now clear your mind for a minute and think about the energy that it takes to flow freely with no strain. So there's, there, there shouldn't be anything that it takes. So there is a flow of energy that freely comes without strain. And that is how we feel when we have our identity and the creator figured out. There's not a strain because we know who we belong to, who made us and who is for us. So let's talk about the things that block us, okay? As people, as artists, as dreamers, as creators, as Julia puts it, what are the system blockers? And I'm like, system blockers, that's when things start flowing too fast. It's like we almost put our own stops on like, whoa, 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 like we're going down a hill too fast and we're worried we're going to crash. Sometimes it's like that with our creativity. We have to stop it. It's like, whoa, this is going off, block. So what does that look like? So what are the things that block us? food she talks about, alcohol, drugs, work. These are the things that numb us out and they slow our creative growth. Do you view it as slowing your creative growth? Some of us numb out thinking it's going to make us more creative. Like that's what we're like believing. I know I believe that for many years. I would want to numb out because I thought it made me more funny or more creative or more fun to be around. I don't know. But then like wake up the next day and there's like a shame to it. Like I wasn't myself. 
I didn't like who I was because you were blocking. Whoa, huh? All right, let's stay on task. I love it. God gets involved when I think I know what I'm going to say and then just switches it all up on me. I also can't believe there's not a cat coming up here yet, especially on my bed. All right. Busy, busy, busy. So that work, back to kind of the work one, because that one kind of, we blow off like it's no big deal. Busy, 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 it dries away our stray creative thoughts. Or that important insight, or that breakthrough, we're busy. Or maybe you're blocked with something else. Maybe it's an obsession over another person that we're codependent with. Or maybe there is a painful, not so good for us relationship that we just keep going back to or get drawn into or can't break away from. Maybe your block is sex. Everyone is using something. Everyone. It's just to the degree and the circumstance that you see yourself doing it. Are you willing to see what it is? Now think of um, the areas where you're abusing your creativity in relation to these blocks. What are the toxic blocks that you're reaching for when the fear creeps in? And you might not even relieve it's, uh, or realize it's fear. But what happens when things start happening? What do you reach for? You see that thing that makes you angry when you think about giving it up. And we all have those. You don't have to say it out loud. You can, but you don't have to. God already knows you already know. The thing that you just makes you angry when you think of giving it up, that's the block that's causing you the most derailment, believe it or not. The one you're clinging on to the most. That one is probably the one that keeps you the most stuck from what the creator has from you, for you. Um, I'm sure you're all internally processing right now what I'm saying. So I'm asking that you explore these blocks on your own. I know it's a very private soul searching thing, but identifying with your blocks will help you free yourself. It will help you um, free your mind from the jail that you're in. If any of you want to talk about your blocks privately with any of us, um, please, please, please come talk to us. We know this stuff is so hard. We know it's highly sensitive, not always appropriate in a big group. And um, it, sometimes this stuff just requires help processing. You need another person to process that you know is safe um, and has been through that and, um, you know, is seeking the creator um, to be able to lead you in, in a direction to him. Find someone like that to talk to, and we're happy to be those people if you need them. Um, if you're afraid to do the work because you're afraid to cry or to become unglued, all right, I got a newsflash. Um, I, I'm hoping you're going to reconsider that plan because I wish there was another way, but there's not. I can just tell you that there's no way out except through. You can't go around the pain or the blocks. I've tried. <laughs> and if you try, you're going to just keep going around the same mountain over and over and over again. Um... And, and that just prolongs and repeats the cycle of what's happening to you. So you have to think about this as a long-term healing or a short-term issue. Are you going to accept short-term, but you got to go through this and feel the pain and go through it and then heal? Because the pain does subside if you do that. If you push your way through it, it does let up. Has anyone had a really hard, awful cry and then a night's sleep after you just exhausted yourself from it and then you wake up feeling like a lot better the next day, almost to the point where you're like, did I get overly upset? Was I overreacting? And, and maybe or maybe not, but maybe it's because you let it all out. 
actually, I'm not maybe, I, I know it is. So there's something to be said for that, okay? Um, maybe your blocks are gonna take more than one day to process. Yeah, I can pretty much assure you they are, but that doesn't mean you don't do the work. It's so worth it. So bottom line, everybody brace themselves here. Blocking is essentially an issue of faith. Hmm. She discusses that a little bit more in the book, but maybe that's a passage we should point out together. So another block is anxiety. I still actively struggle with anxiety. I look for ways to numb that anxiety versus view it as Julia talks about as fuel. So I guess I've kind of grasped that the anger and the jealousy, those are fuel too because they point us in their maps. Well, same thing it looks like with the anxiety. I don't think it's a map, but it's fuel she's talking about and it has to be used. So use it. I have to admit I struggle with that. When you feel that, ah, I want to numb it because it's painful versus use it. So when you're anxious, I feel like that would stop you from being able to do your best work. But I'm wrong. I, I have to push myself in this area and I'm asking for accountability from others that are in close relationship with me to push me on this. I want to grow, but it's scary. Anyone want to take the journey with me? I hope so. Did you check out that workaholism quiz on 167? Yeah, that was a fun time for me. Um, what were your overall observations? Um, in order to block the fierce flow of creative energy, we instead choose to become too busy. Workaholism is an addiction. She talks about it, though, um, how it's a different type of addiction. It's a process addiction versus a substance one. So sometimes it's harder to tell where the abuse is beginning, like when it's too much versus doing none. The only way to get sober is to do less work. Does even the thought of abstaining from work um, make you very uneasy or anxious or guilty or sad. I can tell you personally that I, I actually struggle in this area. Why? Um, I think because deep down it's an avoidance of um, my own self or my own needs. It's an avoidance of real feelings or relationships that there's pain. I don't want to deal with those relationships. I don't want to face the rejection, the neglect, the things that happen within my own camps. So if I stay busy, I can't think about it. Um, basically work is a self-induced static. It's sabotage. And I have to really take a hard inventory and almost like declare that to keep remembering. This isn't some thing I'm going to get all this approval out of, which brings us soon to the next topic. Did you know that having fun is actually scary to a workaholic? Fun makes us nervous because it's fun and fun is linked to creativity, which you don't always realize. Um, she talks about like looking at your calendar and boundaries and setting a bottom line. And what does that look like for you? I mean, not everybody's a workaholic, so it might be something else or a different block, but there's different bottom lines in relationships or with people. But because you're tuning in me to me and because I'm here to give you some application for the teaching, I will tell you that I set some bottom lines a couple years ago and I'm still overall trying to work on these, but I haven't made that much progress. Um, that's kind of frustrating. I looked at this teaching that I started developing two years ago when I um, was doing the artist way before and I'm kind of still in the same place when it comes to this chapter. It's 
kind of a bummer to see like there's like no growth in a certain area. So I'm going to restate my bottom lines and that my, my work day starts at 10 a.m. And it needs to stop around four. It, it still sounds crazy to me. Um, because, of, you know, I get up at 6 a.m. But there's, or more, or sometimes earlier, a little bit later sometimes. But, you know, overall, why can't I work till 10? Because that's how long it takes for me to get my mm together in the morning. Not because I'm crabby, but time with God, prioritize praying, family time, taking care of my animals. You think I could exercise in there? I got to work on that. Anyway, 10 o'clock is like a good time for me. But sometimes I will throw away all that time in the morning that I know enriches me and helps me to get something done for someone else or to hammer out some work when I'm behind. And that's where the enemy steals my time. The critic steals my time. So 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I really need to try to work on that. In the survey she talks, do you do work at night, like during family time? All the time. Or I'm busy with ministry groups, which I love doing. But at what cost, right? So it's finding the balance of the time you need to spend with fam and the time you need for self-care and then the time you need in relationship with others because we need it all. Time with God, time with ourselves, time with others. So boundarying my clients, my employees, even my friends and their needs and the things they ask me, customers, Inviting people like my friends or supporters who are going to keep me um, accountable for self-care or say that seems like a, mu a bit much or you're not feeling super well, are you drinking too much wine, are you, you know, even people that just like love me well. My husband's good at that, like, you know, don't feel good today, lay off the sauce, you know, <laughs> teases me. I'm like, I know. So then I scale back and I feel better. So, um... And he's doing that because he loves me, not because he wants to pick on me. So we have to remember that we also can't choose other accountability partners that have the same blocks we do. Like, I don't need, I can't find a workaholic and ask them to help me. I need to choose someone with something else. So, all right. Then she talks about another block, which is the doubt or drought. Drought, she calls it, but it is doubt. And that doubt comes back to pain. So just know that pain has a purpose. That there's healing you can do. That there's an opportunity for healing in that pain. I mean, the critic tells us what's the, what, what's the use of dreaming, right? But just remember that these droughts, they don't last forever. Even when it feels like it. And when we're fighting with God, because that's what we're doing. And we're losing our faith. And we're having this doubt. Our emotions can feel dried up. We might not even feel like we have access to them. We might have tearless times of grief. Times we just can't cry. It hurts and it can last for periods of time. But it won't last forever. It won't. These times. These self-reflections. They make us grow. They give us compassion for others. And they help us blossom. We are changed through this hard work that we're doing in this reflection and looking at our blocks. When that hard work and that, that those hard, painful times are coming and you're going through that, that's the time of transformation. That's when it's happening. You can't skip it. There's no way around. Go through. You can do it. And then as we get that clarity from our creator, then after we get that clarity, then we become committed to it and consistent in it. We're committed. So we hear what we need to hear. Then we choose to be committed to what we heard. And then to be consistent in doing it, in actions. Now that's not, in, we talked about that, that's not discipline. It's enthusiasm for it. Another block. Ready? All right. Fame. Makes me think of the show from the 80s and the song. I could just bust out right now, but I'm going to save you all. But you're all giggling because you know I will. Don't dare me. I'll do it. Okay, I'm not. 
okay, so fame, don't just think you get a DQ, you're disqualified because you don't care about being famous. Because fame is another word for approval, needing approval, and we all need approval, so everybody pay attention. It's for everybody in the room. <laughs> all right. Here, ready for this one? Fame is not the same as success. I'm going to say that again. Fame is not the same as success. It's highly addictive. and will always just make you more hungry. You want more and more and more of it. Why? Because it's completely based on other people's opinion of you. Fame is dangerous like nuclear waste. It's a byproduct of creative work, especially good creative work. Remember that wanting approval is wanting fame. You think, no, 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 no. But do you not want to do something because no one's going to notice it? It's not that good. I'm not going to, you know, nobody's going to buy my book if I write it. I'm going to write an, I'm going to make music, but no one's, you know what I mean? It's not going to become popular. So what's the point? Okay, that's fame. It's because it's looking outside to others for your validation versus looking within as to why you wanted to do it in the first place. Why you were inspired or even had the idea. Probably the creator inspired idea. But that outward success, what the measurable outcome is, that's, not just, that's actually not for you to even figure out, for you to even worry about. You just follow through on your part. You do it. For the joy of it, because it's going to help one person because it's going to teach you something, because it's going to lead you to someone else or something else. You like that? That's what I do. You don't know. All right. So what do we do instead of, you know, go after that, that fame and to remove that toxicity that you're feeling because you need all this attention from other people because you don't feel good about yourself. And we're all doing this. So I'm kind of like being sarcastic because I want you to take me so seriously. And I can be very difficultly hard when I'm speaking. A little rough. A little bold. I really want you to get this. Because we're all doing it. Including myself. Okay. To remove that toxic feeling, we, what, what do we have to do? We have to self-nurture versus getting that outside approval. And that's why I'm sitting on my bed on my birthday in the rain because I needed some extra nurturing to get myself in the place that I need to be today. And God sent me this cool YouTube video from someone that sends me like little prayers and devotions. Someone not on Facebook, doesn't know it's my birthday. It sent me singing in the rain, the video from the movie, the musical. So I played it and I just listened to watched him dance in the rain and it was so healing it was like a little god wink the person felt joy in the rain and felt like they were supposed to share that with me oops we have an edit because someone was calling me for my birthday today and i went to decline it and boom end of the video all right someday i'll make good videos um, the cure for the fame, let's get to that, is creative, playful joy. Alone. Oh my goodness. It's that inner child. It's being by yourself. You can't get feedback from other people on your artist date when you're alone. Hello? That's the cure for the fame. You gotta cut that off once in a while and that's why you can't do every art thing together in a group. Because the creator can't speak to you. You can't let loose enough. You can't let it flow greatly enough. You'll be too blocked around everyone else all the time. Yeah, we get together and create, but do that on your own. Some of us can bang out the morning pages, but are you doing your artist date? You need to do that. All right, last block, competition. <sighs> what 
we ha we struggle with this right in our own camps and within our closest friendships and people in our tight circles. It poisons our own wells when we are focusing on what everyone else is doing. It, it, it impedes our own progress. It removes the focus off ourselves and we start critiquing and measuring what someone else is doing or creating. The best is when we do this about people we don't even know. <laughs> Sorry, but we do. We were taught to do it. So be kind to yourself. It's a self-protection thing. Makes us prop ourselves up and feel better. But when we compare, we begin asking the wrong questions, she says. And then that produces the wrong answers and we are just off track and it hurts you. The competition hurts you. So we need to stop worrying if our preferences are in or out or if it's too early or too late for us to do something. We need to have the desire to do something for ourselves. Because what happens when we're comparing and, and competing is we look at something and we're like, oh, I can do that better. Okay, nobody wants to admit that, but it happens. So we look at a piece of art and we're like, oh, really? I can do that. But I would do this in our brain. Maybe we're not even saying it, but we're thinking it. Or that's a good idea, huh? Or wow, that person wrote this. I, I could write a better book than this. Do you know that our desire to be better than someone else can seriously choke you from doing anything? Anything. That is just an excuse to do nothing. You don't realize it subconsciously, but why are you knocking it down? Why do you, you know, here's a newsflash. We don't have to have an opinion about everything we see, view, or take in. Whoa. I mean, sometimes, okay, we can have an opinion, but... The best is when um, we want to have opinions about things that aren't any of our business. They don't affect us. Why do we have an opinion? Why are we doing that? So if you're seeking a short-term win versus a long-term goal, you're kind of being fake, she says. And you're limiting yourself. It's important to just be authentic. Stop trying to be first or the best at something, especially right out of the gate. Stop judging yourself or others work too quickly, but especially yourself. In the book, she talks about that. And that was the one thing I did want to read. Um, never, ever, ever judge a fledgling, a fledging piece of work too quickly. Be willing to paint or write badly while your ego yelps resistance. Your bad writing might be the syntactical breakdown needed for a shift in your style. Your lousy painting may be pointing you in a new direction. Art needs time to incubate, in incubate to sprawl a little, to... Um, be ungainly and mishappen and finally emerge as itself. The ego hates this fact. The ego wants instant gratification and the addictive hit of the acknowledged win. The need to win now is the need to win for approval from others. And the antidote is to learn to approve of ourselves. Show up for the work. And that showing up for the work is the win that matters. And that's true. Just show up. That's all the creator expects of us. Just show up. But don't blow it off because it's not going to be good enough and you don't like it and you're stopping early. You're judging it. So stop judging yourself or your work so quickly and stop worshiping your own opinion. Did it ever occur to you that you might not know best about yourself? <gasps> Whoa. So think about this. Do you really need to have an opinion about the subject you're thinking about? How is this opinion even serving you in your life? What these opinions do is they keep us spinning and they keep our focus in the wrong places. So we want to be unblocked and um, 
look, we all struggle. But even though this stuff is hard to admit and it's ugly, I just want to reassure you of something. As we examine our ugly and face our ugly, as that's revealed to us, it's not so that we can stay ugly our whole lives. It's just that recognition of it. But God, he doesn't see us as the ugly mess that we actually are <laughs> in this moment. See, he's, the creator sees us already transformed. He sees us the way he created us to be. See, he's already in future state. He's already thinking sozo. He's already there. But can you get there? Kind of leads back to last week. Do you wholeheartedly and earnestly want to be well? Do you? Because that requires not only hearing truth, but sitting in it, doing the work. Because the creator wants you to be well and he wants to heal you in whatever that's supposed to look like. So I just pray that you take the time, that you look at the self-protection, these ways we block. Identify them, work through them. The tasks were amazing. The deadlies, the awful truths, setting the bottom line. This is just getting real serious with yourself. It's like the rubber meets, meets the road this week. And I pray that you carve out some niches for yourself so that you can grow and transform and let the creator be your protector versus you needing to self-protect in every circumstance. Let's check in.